We hope you'll be blessed and inspired and challenged and motivated by this fresh word from Christian Heritage Church. Uh, What we want to do is every now and then, maybe once a year or so, we want to come before the church and explain what this ministry is that this church is such a big part of. I, you know, we go to missions conference all the time, and uh, it's a, it always amazes me how we, the church, will go someplace and we'll say, well, I didn't know they did that. I didn't know we did this. Uh, this church does some incredible work, not just through us, but throughout the community and throughout many ministries here. And today is just our, our time to share with you the ministry and, and what, it's, what we do and how we do it and why we do it. Um, I will tell you that why we do it is very simple. We're supposed to go and make disciples. Uh, there's nothing, just nothing uh, more than that. Uh, Jesus left us with clear instructions. This is our version of how we go and make disciples. Um, practically speaking, that looks like Beth. Ha- we have a place called Chelsea House for women who are starting their life over again for one reason or another. Um, and I always tell people, nobody ever comes to us because uh, it's a resort. People come to us because something's wrong. And um, in many cases, it's unbelievable the things that people have gone through, and especially the women and the children that come to us. So Chelsea House, which we just celebrated our 10-year anniversary last summer, it's our home for women. And it's an actual home. It's not a shelter. It's an actual house on the west side of town. And Beth could be glad to set up arrangements with if you want to see it or, or meet the ladies. The ladies, most of them, uh, operate out of our thrift store next door, uh, which is a big part of That's where our offices are at, and that's where we operate out of uh, on a day-to-day basis, six days a week. Um, the Good Samaritan houses, or Good Samaritan inns as we call them, are, are actual houses also for men. Mostly men that are, again, they're always something starting, they're starting life over again for some reason, and most of our guys are coming out of prison. And uh, I, don't, I don't think I really have a, enough sensitivity to, uh, to talk about that anymore because I don't see the guys differently. I get to see, first off, there's, there's a number of men in this room right now that I have been visiting with and teaching a class with called Next Steps in a local reentry prison for, since they opened the doors about almost six years ago. And so I see these guys every Monday. So I get to know them very well um, over time. And then when they get out, uh, we go pick them up, literally go to the, to the gate and pick them up. So it's not, a, it's not a big, there's no gap there. We've had a relationship with them. We're, we have classes with them. We have one-on-one mentoring and conversations with them every Monday. And then when it comes their time to get out, they get out at 9 o'clock in the morning, theoretically. Uh, and, um, and one of them got out this morning. At 9 o'clock this morning... Had now here here was the tricky part. What I always tell them, and I like to keep my word. What I always tell them is, I'll pick you up at the gate myself or Mike. We'll pick you up at the gate, and we will take you to breakfast. Well, I was supposed to speak this morning, and, it's, and sometimes they don't let them out at nine o'clock. Sometimes it's ten, ten thirty. You know, it's a little too iffy for me to take a chance on it. So I really reluctantly gave that part because I really love to do that to uh, to Mike to go and pick up uh, a, a, fellow, a fellow today that was counting on us. And Beth said, well, what happens about the breakfast when you're not there? I said, they know I give them breakfast, so I'm sure uh, it'll come up. <laughs> and so I, I got to shake hands with him a minute ago and hug his neck, and he said he had a really good breakfast this morning. So I said, can you imagine this morning being in a prison and within a few hours having breakfast and sitting here? Amen. See, this, this is... This is what we're supposed to do as a church. Amen. We're supposed to go and make disciples. That's not right. sit here and say, y'all come. That's right. And I tell the pastors all the time, all around town, that will say, they're, they're always looking into church building campaigns. <laughs> you don't need a church building campaign. We're supposed to be building a kingdom. Church Amen. growth will take care of itself. That's right. Um, and so when you go where they are and you minister and serve, I've got friends in this room uh, where are you hiding at, Bobby? Raise your hand. Up. There he is, way up in the rafters. Uh, I've got friends in this room, not to point you out, Bobby, that, uh, <laughs> that uh, I met almost 20 years ago, probably, at this point. It's been a long time anyway. Um, that were going through various struggles in life. And it's, it's kind of when I got hooked into it. Was, I can tell you, it was, it'd be 19 years this April. Um, that I first walked out, got out of the pews and went down to a place and started uh, trying to help. And what I discovered is you didn't have to know a lot. I always call it the 30-minute rule. I got to the rescue mission. It was closed in those days in the daytime. I got there to survey selling it, in fact. Uh, I was in that part of the world at that time. And I, I was looking at their signs. And I'd never been there before. And I see they, they opened at 4 o'clock. There was a, there was a sign that said they, in, they enter here. There's a meal served here. And there's a, a place to sleep over there. 
And I had done what I needed to do. I started getting back in my truck and a fellow comes walking out the street. Not a stereotypical homeless looking guy. Just a blue collar guy that had run into some real difficult times and finally had lost everything. And that day, uh, he walked in on the property to the Haven Arrest Rescue Mission and just lost and said, do you work here? I said, uh, no, what do you need? He said, uh, he started telling me a story a little bit. He said, I don't know what to do. Where did, what, how's this place work? I said, well, they open at four, you go through here, you eat over there, and you sleep over there. All I knew was 30 minutes more than he did. And it made a huge difference in that man's life. I saw him kind of settle in a little bit. And it was about 30 minutes before they were going to open. I said, uh, I said uh, hey, you want, I'll, I'll sit with you until they get here. So I sat under the open country and sat there and talked to him. And casually enough, I said, would you have a relationship with God? And, and he said, man, I don't know what I believe. So we talked for about 30 minutes. He, he made a decision to follow Jesus Christ. And then they opened the doors. I shook hands with him. And I don't know that I ever saw him again. But I know that he, 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 we were able to direct, part of our ministry motto is building bridges between people and the Lord. And we were able to get him to the foot of the bridge. He was able to walk through and, and he's wherever God has him now. That changed my life profoundly. I realized, you know, I don't need to know anything more than I know right now. I just need 30 minutes more information than I have now. He didn't care that I'm so flawed. He didn't care that I struggle with sin. He didn't care that what my story was. He just cared that I cared. And then he was able to take it from there. That's the essence of the ministry we're talking about. Now, what I want to do for the next few minutes is give you the, the structure. Because as I was sharing with some of the guys the other night, we, were having, we have a class uh, every Friday night, which you're welcome to attend, by the way. It's right next door. We, we serve pizza at 6 o'clock. And then about 6.15 or so, we, watch, we do something. Something's constructive. I don't have... Sometimes we bring somebody in. Sometimes we do a DVD. Sometimes we watch a movie. It's just something constructive to do on a Friday night. Because a lot of us have gotten in bad habits in our lifetime about what to do on a Friday night or a Saturday night. So I just want to change the wheel while they're, while they're in our, under our roof. And uh, so I was sitting there talking to the guys. And we were watching a, finishing up a DVD series by Rick Warren. And I was saying, you know, these are very practical things. It's not all philosophical. It's not all theological. It's, it's, sometimes it's very practical. Very simple things in life that will help you be more constructive, more productive, and more successful in life. I'm not talking about financial success. I'm talking about living success. So uh, we talked about that. So I'm going to give you the, the kind of the outline. And some of you have heard this before. In fact, this is the part where my guys will get to go to sleep because they've heard this a thousand times. Uh, so if they start snoring you. Um, where's Brent at? Um, so he worked. He just got off this morning at 7 o'clock. He went to work last night at 11 o'clock. So he might doze off. Um, our, our ministry, a structure, and God gave us, Beth and I, this years ago, he gave us a structure that we call the five R's. And I could stop right now and I could tell you there's a number of people in this room that could tell you what the five R's are. But I'm going to tell you, they're rescue. Oh, wow. Everybody knows what they are now. Uh, to rescue is the first R. The lost, the hopeless, the wounded, the hurting, the misused, and the unused. That's a whole bunch of us in this room, by the way. I just about covered everybody. Some of us are just in the wrong place doing the wrong thing. We've, we've attached to something that God didn't call us to do. It's a good thing, but God didn't call us to do it. Uh, and some of us, many of us uh, in church are unused. I, I went to, a, to visit a friend. Uh, uh, by the way, the scriptures that relate to that, Psalm 82, 3 and 4, talks about the scriptural mandate of what we're talking about. That God calls us to help the needy, the afflicted. The widows, the orphans. God calls us to do that. It's not, when sometimes people will ask us, why do you all do that? Beth was telling me that one of the guys asked her yesterday that was working out the house, why do you and Brother Glenn do this? And, she, and that's it. Because God told us to. It's not rocket science. It's just, and do what you can do. Again, don't worry about what you can't do. Don't worry about what you don't know to do. Do what you can do. So the rescue is the first step. And, and rescue isn't just salvation rescue. Some, all of us need rescuing multiple times in our lifetime in various ways and for various things. Sometimes it's just physical. You know, something happens and we need to be rescued. Sometimes uh, it's emotional. Sometimes it's financial. There's all kind of reasons why we need to be rescued in life. Um, and so we're just constantly on the lookout for somebody who needs to be rescued. You see them all over town. By the way, you see them in churches. You see them in government buildings. You see them in businesses. You can sit in a, in a restaurant and watch your waiter or waitress working and you can just about spot somebody who's in trouble. Somebody who's hurting. Somebody who's who's struggling, they're, they're just, just, uh, they're, uh, um, just can't connect. 
Um, so it's easy to spot them if you open your eyes. It's easy to spot them if you ask God to help you spot them when you get up that morning. One of the first things I ask God is, you know, open my eyes. Let me see. Don't let me get so caught up and so routine oriented that I'm not sensitive to what you have for me today. And so rescuing people is the first step. If, if, we, if we see somebody in trouble and we just try to, uh, here's, here's a way that we often get trapped. The enemy, by the way, perverts everything God tells us to do. Right. Every good thing that God gave us, the enemy has a perverted version of it. So the enemy will tell us, just throw some money at them. I know good churches in this town with people with great gifts of mercy that, that the people that go to those churches to ask for help think that that church is an ATM machine. I've had the conversations with the pastor. And, and he said, well, we just don't like to uh, challenge people like that. And I said, well, uh, you know, it's kind of like a, a parent that lets their kid have, well, you want ice cream for supper every night? Okay, you know, I don't want to upset you. You know, you, you got sometimes uh, love can be tough. Amen. And it's hard to do the right thing sometimes because it's not popular a lot of the times. But it, well, I've had people come in and say, at churches where I've been helping out and say, uh, I need help. I need some money to get down the road, this, that, and whatever. And I had this one guy in particular. I was sitting at a church and I was, it was Wednesday night. I think it was a Wednesday night. And we were having a service and somebody kids said, there's a man in the back that's really in trouble and needs some help. So I go back there and he sits down. Man, he had it down. He was, he was telling me all the buzzwords and I got this, I got a carload of kids and we're just passing through and we're trying to get home to, you know, her mother died, that, 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 and he's giving me this whole song and dance. And I, and I don't mean to be insensitive, but I've heard these things so many times uh, that I know how to look into it. You know, it's a, it's a, there's some practical steps you should take. You shouldn't just say, oh, I feel sorry for you and here's some money. So what I told him after he spoke long enough, he spoke himself right into totally disbelieving it. And uh, so when he got through saying this thing, I said, okay, well, first off, I said, I, first thing I want you to hear is, we want to help you. He goes, oh, thank God. I said, no, I mean, we really want to help you. I mean, seriously, I want to help you. And he kind of started looking at me. I said, so let me start off by telling you, I don't believe a thing you just said. <laughs> and, uh, and he said, really? Well, how can I have said that in a way that would have been a little more believable? <laughs> he actually said that. And I said, well, I'm not going to coach you. I'm just going to tell you. And so I told him, I said, we don't want to kick your can down the street. We don't want to give you a little money and get some Theoretically, get some gas money. I'm sure he did need gas money, by the way. Uh, I said, but I want to help you. I want you, those kids are out there in that car and your wife. I want, we want to help them. So we, here's what I want you to do. And I gave him some instructions. I said, now you go out there. When the service is over, I'll meet you in the back here and we'll go take care of that. You know where he was at when I got there? I have no idea. He was going for the next easy touch. That's where he was going. So I'm not helping him. And even when I, even though I didn't get a chance to really um, do much for him, uh, maybe just the fact that somebody can see the truth, well, God will use that somehow. I don't know how. And like I said, I don't mean to be insensitive to him. I just know that's not true. What he was telling was not true. People, I, I've had people, I can't tell you how many times people called us and told us that they're, I need to catch a plane. I need to do it this afternoon or catch a bus because my mother died in Ohio. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry for your loss. Let's we'll start off with, first off, what's the name of the funeral home so I can confirm everything? Never happens. There is no funeral home. And I've had people that, of course, they make cycles sometimes. I've had people come back around and tell me two years later, my mom just died. I said, man, that woman must have had an incredible life. She said resurrection twice that I've known. Uh, so, so again, it's not that we're insensitive to it, but we're not helping. And by the way, when I, when I, when I catch them in the lie, that, I don't say, so get out of here. So now let's get real. You know, I really want to help you. I don't want to just you know, put a little salve on it or just feed the, the, the problem. All right, so rescue is a very important part. The next thing is redeem. A redemption in, in our in the, in the vernacular we're talking about today is exchanging something. To exchange a self-centered life for a Christ-centered life. Now that's just talk until you start the, until you finish the rest of this out. To exchange a self-centered life for a Christ-centered life. And the scriptures that relate to that is Mark 30, uh, 8, 34, and 38. Where God talks about, you know, if you... To, to paraphrase it, if, if I gain everything in this world and lose my soul, then what did I gain? That's right. I have to exchange the things that I think are so important in this lifetime for a Christ-centered life. When I have a Christ-centered life, everything changes. My values change. My, my joy changes. Uh, my purposes change. Everything changes when I exchange my self-centered life. And a lot of times people, you know, we, most of us, all of us to some degree, we don't want to give up on some things. There are some things I just don't want to give up on. That I know are no good. That I know are not helping me. They may have been okay at one point in time, but they're not doing me any good now. 
And so uh, my, my, in fact, I, I saw a guy at, a, at another ministry uh, earlier last week, and I didn't recognize him. He, came, he goes, Pastor Glenn. I said, yeah, I shook hands. He goes, you don't recognize me. And I said, no, sorry, I don't. He goes, uh, he said, well, you wouldn't. He said, I met you probably 18 years ago at the Haven Arrest. <laughs> I said, okay. He goes, and I just want you to know, you know, da, da, da. he was telling, sharing a bunch of stuff and what he's doing now. He was volunteering at this place. He goes, he said, and I started walking up. He goes, by the way, I never have forgot one of your, one of your famous sayings. I was that. He goes, well, how's that working for you? Because that's what I used to tell him. I said, well, you know, we need to do this or do this or that. And they said, well, no, I, I, I got to go do this one more thing. I got to do this one thing. And I said, well, you've been doing that for a while. Now, how's that working out for you? You know, if you just, if, if you think it's working out for you, I'm going to save my breath. Because no matter how bad it is, if you think it's working out for you, you're going to hang on to it right to the bitter end till you have no more cards to play. That's right. So there's no point in me trying to convince you. But when you're ready, then I can help. So exchanging the self-centered life is, is redemption. So let's say we've rescued somebody. They're, they've agreed to. They've come to us. By the way, I have a number of guys that have been coming into our ministry now over the last several years who do not have to come to us. They're in prison. They have a home to go to. They have a family to go to. They may not be from this area. And more and more of them, our class uh, used to be, it's a little chapel. It's about, about the size of our chapel here. And uh, it used to be two or three of us and me, uh, maybe sometimes just me, uh, and not very many uh, over the years. And over the years, it's grown and grown and grown. And for the last few months, anyway, or so, it's pretty much standing room only. It's getting more and more crowded. And I'm not teaching the class anymore, by the way. Guess who's teaching the class now? I mean, as far as leading it, the inmates. They're doing, they're doing, going right now, they're going through experiencing God. Amen. Uh, and I, during that, it's a two hour time frame, by the way. So while they're doing that, I have a little side room and I get to talk to guys one on one, five, 10 minutes. You'd be amazed at how important that is. Somebody, you know, seeing that I'm there every Monday, pretty much. And they get a chance to come in and share their heart. I've had, I've pe- had people come to know Jesus in that room. I've had people crying about their, their sins or their past in that room. I mean, it's an incredible experience right there and smack in the middle of a prison. And so the inmate leadership, and all the guys are, and I don't mean they're just reading the book. I mean, they're doing the experience in God. If you've never done that, by the way, if you ever hear it being done, I highly recommend it. It changed my life a number of years ago. And um, so... The, the, the uh, chaplain was, uh, bless his heart, he's confused by what's going on there. Um, first off, it's just kind of doesn't feel good to have the inmates leading anything. Uh, is there is kind of the cultural mindset. And so he struggled with a little bit. But, I mean, he's accommodating us, but he struggled a little bit. So I came out of there the first week that the inmates were leading it. And, um, and they were going at it, but I mean, they were really having an in-depth Bible study. And I was getting ready to leave and I was walking out the door and the chaplain, uh, had looked up at the, one of the guys that was standing at the front at the time. He goes, uh, I see there's a new teacher. I said, no, sir. Same teacher, same message, different messenger. Same teacher has been teaching every class we've ever had. And it's certainly not me. And, uh, he goes, and the guys knew exactly what I was talking about because they know who's teaching them. You know, they, they're just having a, a lively Bible. They're, by the way, there's some guys in that prison that know the Bible better than most of us in this room know it. Don't kid yourself thinking, well, just because they're in prison, they're, 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 they're stereotypical to what we think. I know some of the brightest people I've ever met are in prison I know, uh, and, and have made a mistake. I know a lot of guys, a lot of young men who made one serious mistake with a, getting in a vehicle and driving and killing somebody and doing 20 plus years in prison. Good people made a bad choice and are living with the consequences. So we rescue, we're in the process of redemption. Well, what, what happens next? Well, if you just, uh, it's kind of like when you have a, a service and you, and you have a great uh, message and a great movement of the Holy Spirit and people make a decision for Christ. And then you say, well, good, God bless you. Go ahead and have a good life. That's like taking a baby who's just born in the nursery and saying, there he is. Uh, he looks healthy. He's got everything good. Well, good luck. Tell me how that works out. That's not a good way to do it. You, that's where the work begins. The Bible doesn't say go and make converts. It says go and make disciples. So to go and make disciples is a lot of work. All right. So the, we see a rescue and a redemption. Now, we, now the work begins. Now we're going to do the rebuild. So how do you rebuild a life? Well, the first thing is if you're going to rebuild a life, you have to build it on God's word. If you rebuild it on anything else, it's going to fall short. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 talks about, what God's, about God's word. And what it's useful for. Uh, and, and it's useful for everything good, by the way. 
Amen. If you look at the scripture, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, you'll see, and this is a very well-known scripture, but when you apply it to rebuilding a life, it's, it's not a good scripture. It's, you can't do it without it. Amen. You can't rebuild a, a Christ-centered life and not use God's word. The scripture, you have to have the scriptures. So when you do that, the, the part that I wanted to have was all scriptures inspired by God and profitable for what? Teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. You have to have those pieces because most of us have not had that kind of foundation. We've had our family traditions. We've had our, our cultural traditions. But, and some of those may or may not be uh, biblical, may not be Christian, but they're, they're just what we've learned to live on. And it's how we, it's our, it's our go-to. It's how we operate. The next thing on the, on the rebuild, you start, the rebuild, by the way, is a lifelong process. There's no such thing as done. That's right. One thing I love about the ministries God's given me is I'm not a manager. And God prepared me in my, in my childhood experiences, uh, moved, my family moved around a lot. Um, and, and so I was on different sports teams. I just by the time I'd get it going, then we'd move somewhere else and I have to start over again and make my way up to the top again and such. So I learned to, to start fresh on a regular basis. Then when I got into business, um, I early on, uh, started, it was in financial services for almost 30 years. And I, I developed the ability to go into places where they had had a problem, a serious problem in a remote location and rebuild a team, or in some cases go and build a team from nothing. That was great preparation for what we do now. And in ministry, when Beth and I, well, when I started, when, before Nancy died in uh, 99, I went down to rescue the rescue mission. They were having to close it. It was, it was about to uh, fold up. And so I went in there and started doing what I was doing. I had no idea what I was doing, by the way. In the rescue. I'd never been to a rescue mission. But God gave, left me just the right people and, and, uh, and, gave, and brought people over the years. And we were able to keep the building, uh, keep the, the operation not only open, but growing dramatically. When I, when I first got there, they had a capacity of 40 and an average occupancy during the spring where I was at, at that time in you know, 15 or 20. Um, within a year or two, we had a, uh, much to the fire department chagrin, although they did eventually become my buddies. Um, we had a capacity and a normal occupancy of 150. We took every corner in that property that you could legally put somebody in some places, maybe a little shady for legally. Uh, and we kept somebody there and we had phases and we created this program we're talking about, by the way, about the phases of it. God just blessed it and grew it. And, and then along the way, I, I started noticing a lot of the guys that came to the rescue mission had just had been incarcerated at some point. In fact, about 75% of them had been incarcerated at some point. So I kind of started focusing a little more on incarceration. And then in 08, uh, another ministry that was folding, some wonderful people with the best of intentions just could, didn't have a system. And they were folding. And so I went over there and started helping them a little bit. And we started restoring and rebuilding that program. And that one specialized in guys with very difficult charges, uh, murder, sex offense. I mean, people who really, they're going to be very, that the average one of us, including myself, I was raising daughters. The average one of us would say, I can't help that person. Right? You know, we have preconceived notions about those people. Uh, but notice, notice that phrase, those people. You know how often that gets used to, to uh, prejudice something? Those people. Whatever it is, the rest of that sentence is. So I didn't know any better. So I just, I, I knew some of the guys at the rescue mission had had some of these charges and they were some of my best friends and the guys I trusted. And so then I, uh, so I had heard, I read all the information. I read all the uh, surveys and the studies and this and that. And I was saying, well, some of these things, they, first off, they contradict each other. And uh, so I thought, but I know people, I know citizens, I know people. So I went over there and we started out rebuilding that one. That place had six units to house people in, two of which were functional after three and a half years. And only one or two people living there at the time. And, by the, and just within a year or so, we had uh, 36 men on a regular basis living there. Um, and again, some of the finest men I know. Some of the most devout, loving Jesus people you know that I met while I was there. And, and so God rebuilt that one. In the meantime, by the way, in those gaps of time, there were little churches that didn't know. They were kind of struggling with uh, getting started. And mostly in poor areas. And we would go and do outreaches and... And the, what we do here with the straight out of church idea, 
we would we had an organized where we would go concentrate on a church or an area for a summer. We'd be there maybe once a month or whatever. We would do an outreach and a meal giveaway and clothes giveaway, things that would draw people in and get to know them. And then we would go to the next one. We would try to boost the church up and then move to the next one. And we've done that for many, many, many years. Uh, so we have helped start, plant, and or boost up, I can't tell you how many churches, mostly smaller churches um, all around the community. And then some years later, when we got involved in the, as I continue to specialize in it, we got more involved in, more focused on people coming out of prison, we came up with the idea of the uh, Good Samaritan Inn and houses for men coming straight out of prison, kind of a transitional housing op- op- situation. And that's currently where I'm primarily focused. So the rebuild is much easier if people live with you than if you're just giving them counsel. That's right. Think about that, raising kids. You know, when, you, when you're there every day, you know, it's, it's easy to get shined up on Sunday. But how about Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday? And, it's, and we even have Mike and I talk about the, the 30-day honeymoon. It's easy for, it's not easy, but it's, easy, it's somewhat easy for guys to come to us. And, but they love us when they first get there. Well, first off, they just got out of prison. So, you know, uh, so somebody, they love us. Man, this is great. About 30 days into it, man, that guy next to me snores. And, you know, I got to work and I don't get paid. And, you know, so the, the luster wears off after a while. And so then you start getting down to the real issues. And so some guys stay and some guys don't. And I learned a long time ago the way I'm able to do this. I mean, I have literally seen in the 19 years or so we've been doing this, thousands and thousands and thousands of people, many of whom I knew very well, very personally and loved a great deal. And I've seen large numbers of them succeed and go on with life. I've seen some number of them not succeed and go to death, still struggling. And so one of the things I learned early on, Beth, when Beth and I first got married, and I came home from work one day, and uh, I was, she knew about a particular guy that had been with me a long time, and he had fallen off and gone out and got drunk or left the ministry or whatever. And I came home and said, oh, so-and-so left today. And I told she goes, oh, my goodness. And so she's going on and on. And she goes, and I, after I told her everything, I said, so what's for supper? She goes, how could you eat when one of your best friends just had a fallout like that? I said, well, honey, here's what I've learned. Over these years, they all have a God, and I'm not Him. Amen. I don't take the credit, and I don't take the blame. I'm just there. I'm just facilitating. Flawed as I am, I'm just facilitating. Some some people do great with it. Some people don't. It's just not something I can focus on. And Beth, some years later, learned uh, that, uh, and she's got a poem that she knows how to say. I don't know how to do it, but I'll tell you the the essence of it is. There's a hole in my heart, and it's and they're, they're, the pain that people bring to me come through my heart and go on to Jesus. And his healing comes through my heart and goes on to them. I'm just the conduit. My job is to stay close and clean. Amen. So that he can, he can do what he does through me. That's all my job is. So I don't get to, uh, it's, I was told the guys the other day, it's like a vessel. And I had a coffee cup sitting there. I said, you know, when I get up in the morning, I always have styrofoam cups so I don't have to wash dishes. Um, I said, if I, if I left a dirty cup there, I'm not going to use it. I'll throw it away. I'm looking for a clean vessel. Now, I said, if I had my, cup, my styrofoam cup sitting here and I had a Starbucks cup sitting here, which one has the best coffee in it if you're a big coffee connoisseur? I don't particularly like Starbucks coffee, but if you were a con- coffee connoisseur, the Starbucks coffee, right? Well, what if I had mixed them and I put my cheap stuff I put in this one and the, the Starbucks stuff in that one? Uh, does that make it... Not, now it's not as good because it's not in this cup. The vessel has nothing to do with it. The vessel just has one job. Be clean and ready. Amen. That's all we got to do. Amen. God will use you however he's going to use you. So we've rescued, we've redeemed. We're in the process, ongoing process of rebuilding. So now we're going to restore. When people, when people have come to us, I always tell everybody, when I was a kid, I had dreams. I was going to play center field for, actually eventually I was going to pitch for the Yankees because I couldn't run that fast. But uh, but I was, good, and I was a good pitcher. I played college baseball. I was a pretty good pitcher. And I had plans to be a, uh, a pitcher for the Yankees. At some point when that wasn't going to happen, uh, and past you know, being a superhero or whatever, and I was just going to do life, what was your dreams and hopes? What was your dreams and hopes? What were you going to do? Well, mine was to be, um, I was going to be Andy Griffith in Mayberry. <laughs> I love that show. Now, think about Andy. He wasn't, that character, he wasn't really a law enforcement guy. He was a community environment guy. 
And I thought, you know, I just want to go someplace. So I literally went, to, I was living in Los Angeles at the time I went to LAPD. I was going to study under them because in those days they were the premier uh, technology wise in the world. And I was going to study in there and be a cop for 10 years, move back to the south somewhere, be in a small town, be the sheriff. That was my plan. But along the way, and by the way, I wasn't a believer in those days. That was just my, that was my inherent thing that God had put in me about compassion for people and wanting to be a shepherd and stuff. I didn't know that that was going to translate to the gift, spiritual gift of pastoring at some point. But long story short, the, the cop thing didn't work out, but the shepherd thing did. And as I finally realized what that was, then I was able to say, oh, that's not being a cop. It's, it's, it's doing. So when I was in business, I used to shepherd my people. And when God let me finally take over the rescue mission, I got to stop pretending I would do anything else and just shepherd people. So the restore, restoration is your dreams and your hopes, relationships, hopes, and dreams. Jeremiah 29, 11, everybody knows the scripture. Well, not everybody knows it, but a lot of people know it. But basically God has said, he has a plan for me Amen. and it's for good. Amen. It works out even through the problems. It works out. And when you get lined up with God, what God's talents he's given you, your spiritual gifts he's given you, the experience he's allowed you to go through and the calling he's given you, when you get all that lined up, that happened to me when I walked on the street. I mean, when I walked on the campus at the Haven Arrest, all my preparation was all of a sudden lined up. And I thought that was it. I was going to be the rescue mission director for the rest of my life. Ten years after that, I got run off. I get run off from a lot of places, by the way, so y'all ever want to get... that doesn't really change my life much. Because remember, I'm a starter, so if you want to run me off, it, uh, I'll just go somewhere else. Somebody said, well, what is going to happen? Somebody was telling us when, when we were going through all this thing with the bank, what happens if somebody else buys the building and, and they don't want to, uh, they're not as gracious to us as the church is about that? I said, that we'll go wherever God sends us. You know, I mean, I sure hate to move, but, you know, it is what it is. So restoring your dreams and hopes. And Joel, I, I was uh, speaking shortly after I got saved, a year or two after I got saved, I was speaking at a men's conference, or at a, men's, at a business men's meeting, not a men's conference. And um, a, a fellow was sitting there, and I, gave, I shared my testimony of what I'd gone through in life and this and that, and some pain and some things I'd suffered. And the guy came up to me afterwards and said, uh, I've got two things for you. One is a word from God, and the other one is, I think, from God, but don't, don't hold God to this. I said, what's that? Because I had been, my wife had left me and I was divorced and I didn't have any children and I was a brand new believer and I was just trying to figure out what's going to happen next in life. And he said, one, he said, the word from God is Joel. And in the book of Joel, in that, in that group of scriptures, it talks about a, rest, a restoration. And uh, part of it is that God will restore the years the locusts have eaten. Whatever you've gone through, whatever you struggle through, God didn't waste it. He's going to use that to actually rebuild and restore and use you and restore the years of locusts of Eden. And then uh, and, uh, as he goes through that, the man says to me, he goes, that's the word from God. He goes, the word from, you, from me that may be from God. He says, I believe that God let me know that a year from now, you're going to be married to a godly woman and you're going to have a house full of children. I said, really? <laughs> a year from now, I'm not married. I'm not dating anybody. And he goes, yeah. That was, I believe, in January. That uh, a year is actually, it was fall of the previous year. The next fall, I was sitting in my home in the condominium where we lived with my wife, Nancy, who I'd married, who had three children, by the way. Uh, and we were sitting there. I was, I was watching the uh, kids play in this room. I was watching Nancy and her brothers, and she had five brothers. And her brother, there was Thanksgiving. We were doing, they were doing all kinds of activity. They had their nieces and nephews were everywhere. And I was sitting there in the middle just enjoying the scene. And I heard God say, there. And I knew exactly what he was talking about. God has restored the years the locusts have eaten in my life over and over and over. He will restore your. So then we've got all that. We've rescued, we've redeemed, we've rebuilt. We're in the process of rebuilding. We're seeing dreams. We, we talked to the guys and the ladies about restoring their hopes and dreams. The hopes and dreams that God has for you, which is better than anything you've come up with anyway. And so God has given you new hopes, new dreams, and they're better than those. It's much better than pitching for the Yankees. Although this year I would like to pitch for the Yankees. <laughs> they just got a whole bunch of, that's a whole other story. Um, I, have, I have had all this done, so what do I do? This is where it goes back to the misused and the unused. So I praise God and I come in, I sit in a church service on a regular, every time the doors are open and I praise God and I enjoy all the abundance of life that's got to give me. That is not rescinding. That's right. God didn't save us to sit. He saved us to go. Amen. Go and make disciples. Remember that part? The, and the, the last thing is on the resend is in the book of Acts. What's God tell us in Acts 1.8? He 
He says, we're going to go. That's right. And you're going to have power to do what you... You say, well, I don't know how to do that, and I don't know how to do this. God will provide you. To impact the community by discovering and, by discovering and living God's will. Discovering and living it out. Not thinking about it, not talking about it, doing it. All right? And then, of course, the Great Commission. To go and make disciples. Now, I'm going to tell you one last story and we'll wrap it up. I told you in the beginning that uh, the reason I'm speaking today is because we, we had a financial, well, we had a crisis at the ministry, which, by the way, is pretty normal. It's not like it's an unusual thing. Uh, but it, it, there, every time has been a little bit unusual. So I, I, I'm not very technologically oriented. I took my phone. And I, I was praying about it. Went home that night. We couldn't make our bills. We, we literally couldn't pay our rent to the church. The church has given us incredible arrangements. And, and it really broke my heart to call Pastor Steve and say, we can't pay the rent. And he said, just hold on. And then instead of running us off like most people would, said, well, you, were, you must have did a lousy job. You know what? You need to be a better steward. And what he said was, why don't you come to the church and let's let the church know. I mean, that's the exact opposite of what you normally get from somebody when you're not taking care of your business. So I went home that night and I, I prayed about it. And you know, I, I didn't really have any particular fear or burden. I just felt I needed to talk to the Lord about it. So I got up that morning. I was riding back in over here. And I'm riding along. And uh, the thought that God put in my heart, when I kid you not, it's called the Gideon 300. I came up with this plan that I believe was from God, and I came up with it 18 years ago when I was at the rescue mission. Then I tried it at CARE, and then I tried it here, and I tried it. It has never worked. The idea, idea behind it, by the way, was I heard on the 700 Club, I heard uh, them talking about when they got started 36 years or whatever it was, they had a little small TV station. They, were, they, just want, they didn't want a TV station. They just wanted a program where they could do prayer. That was their thing to, to back before technology was this day. They didn't have videos. So they were just going to read people's prayers, pray for them, and have people respond. They were going to show the world what prayer looks like. That's all they cared about. They ran into a wall. They were just struggling along. And finally, they, they came up with this idea. They said, well, let's, we get 700 people. If you give $10 a month, we could make it. So they put the word out. And that became the 700 Club. Now they have hundreds of thousands of people given millions of dollars, and they've upgraded the technology, and they've done all kinds of things. So whether you like the 700 Club or not is not the point. Uh, but when I heard that, I thought, you know, back to the, when I was trying to run the rescue mission, I said, well, we need, we, need some, we need to stabilize our monthly giving. And so I came up with this idea, the 300 Club. We just had, to, based on Gideon, of course, we just had 300 people that would commit to give a dollar a day, approximately $30 a month, a dollar a day. Surely there are 300 people that could do that. And we started, and so I launched it. Nobody supported it. Even I, I wrote the check for about three months, and I stopped supporting it. Uh, you know, it just, people, we get busy. We're, we're doing other things. I stopped supporting it. So then a few years later, it came up again. I got a few more people, and I had them. And by the way, I told the story to a guy the other day. He goes, I've been supporting you since the first time. And I know he's been supporting us for the first, but he's given so much more than $30 a month that I, I didn't equate it to that's how he started giving to us. So, Anyway, when I was coming in the other day, and God put in my heart, the Gideon 3, I went, oh, Lord. You know that doesn't work. Remember, I've tried this over and over. It's embarrassing, Lord. I really actually had this conversation driving in. And God said, now's the time. So I went, okay, there goes the net. Now, do you have that video? I mean, that, that picture of the board. You, do? you can't read that, but that's not the point. I don't want you to be able to read it. I want you to be able to see something. I told you I'm technologically challenged. I can't even say it. Um, so I went back to my office. I got my, well, first off, I got my phone, and I, I don't know how to use the phone too well, but it turns out you can't uh, send a text to everybody at once. It turns out I didn't know that. Um, and it turns out I have 1,100 names in my phone. So when I screened through all the ones I knew for sure were landlines, and I knew for sure were people that would probably shoot me if they got a text from me, I had about 800 names, and I found out you can do 20 at a time. And what I didn't find out, unfortunately for some of y'all, was that everybody gets everybody's response unless you know how to do something different. <laughs> Which led to some very funny conversations, by the way. One person said, one, one of my friends whose name's on that board said, I loved it when you, the one person responded, who obviously had a phone number of somebody I used to know, and didn't know me from anything, their only response was, I'm an atheist. 
To which my response was, it's okay, we help everybody. Uh, so I went to my office. I'm trying to do this. And I couldn't, a problem occurred. I would send out 20 and I would start going the next one and people started hitting it. I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. And I went, oh, uh, I don't know how to do that. Uh, well, where did they send the money? And, uh, uh, and so I didn't know how to do with the next thing. So Beth told me how to do that. So I put a little thing on there. Well, if you want to pay by check, you want to pay by, like we do here. And by the way, the thing when I was writing in, I was thinking, I don't like to do this. Lord, and the Lord said, because you're pride, that's why you don't like to do it. Because I listen to all kind of Christian programming that at the end of every one of them tells me how to send money in. And many of them I send money into it and I've never resented it. So why would I think people resent if we tell them what the situation is? They either do or they don't, but they don't have to resent it. And if people resent it, again, they have a God and I'm not him. I'm not taking credit or blame for it. God told me to do this, like, like Darren said. You know, so I'm going with your deal, Darren. God told me to say it, I'm going to just tell you. So I went to my room, and that's a, an actual grease board. Of my, I went and took it out of one of the other rooms. I put there, the first name on the, on the left is Glenn and Beth. PD means they paid already, by the way. Uh, this is really high tech. Uh, so, I, so I wrote that, if people called in or texted back and said, I'm in, I just wrote their name down. Or whatever I had them coded under. Some of them don't have their name, it has different things. Their name, the, the, seriously, the, the, this board is one of the most powerful things that's ever happened to me. There's 91 names currently on that board as of the 13th. There's more since then, but I, they finally took it away from me and they're putting it in the computer. Uh, I'm going to save that picture though. Because on that board, there are names, and I'll, and I'll tell you the, the most, I love all the people that are on that board. Some of them I don't know who they are. Matter of fact, a lot of them I don't know who they are. You know who they were? Somewhere along the way, and I've helped with some mama whose child's in prison or is going to prison or, or this or that happened, whatever, and I got their phone number, we corresponded for a month or two, and then it went on and we did whatever we did and they moved on and that's that. I don't know who they are. I just didn't delete their phone number. So when they got my thing, one mother... On the first column on the left, if you go down near where it says, down near the bottom, one, two, one, two, three, four names up, it says, Chris G. Mom. That mother, whose son's in prison, he's one of the ones that committed a vehicular manslaughter. Um, I led him to the Lord, by the way, sitting in the, in the Leon County Jail, uh, months after I first started ministering to him. That mother, who I don't, I, I don't talk to her, you know, it's been years ago when that case we had settled, I've helped move him around a little bit, but I've, I really don't have a daily conversation with people. That mother sent me a text. She said, uh, Pastor Glenn, not only are we in, but we had we were, we were short. Our average monthly budget was running short. Without the extraordinary bon- uh, banquets and stuff, was running short thousands of dollars. She said, if we had the money, I would send that and then some. She says, there's nothing that, that our family wouldn't do for that ministry, and we're in. We don't have a lot. I know they're poor people. She said, I know we don't have a lot of money, but we're sending it. We're in. And I thought, you know, and then there's so many other ones, I don't even know their stories. I just know that God touched them through this hole in our heart. And now he's called them in. I, start, I told somebody the other day, I started to feel like Jimmy Stewart at the end of It's a Wonderful Life. I mean, people are calling from all over the country and all over the community with a dollar a day. Now, some people could do more. And by the way, I asked for a dollar a day and I asked for a commitment. We don't have any fundraisers between now and uh, three months from now. And I said, if, I, if you could just get that kind of support for three months, that will at least get us through to that point. We'll worry about that crisis after that one. Some people said, not only am I going to do it now, but I'm going to do it. This is going to be one of my regular ongoing giving. If when we build it up to where we have a constant, if, if not those same 300, but a, a replacement 300 on a regular basis, the things we can do when we have banquets and such as that is have more houses. I have a list right now of men that we can't take. That we're having to tell the prison, sorry, we don't have any room for them. I know it's God's business, but that hurts. Beth has a, a, a stack of women and children and circumstances in the dozens and dozens that we can't take because we don't have enough room for them. Now, I trust God. I know God's got a plan. But I'm going to tell you, as his messenger, my message to us as this particular congregation and wherever God wants to speak is... Uh, uh, exactly what Pastor, I told Pastor, Pastor Steve. I said, man, last week I was sitting there. I had just done this. And I came here Sunday and I was sitting there about to fall out of my chair. Man, it was an incredible message about giving in a godly way. Yeah. 
not out of coercion, not out of pride, not out of recognition, but because God puts on your heart. And I have one lady, last story, one lady on that board. Her name is Pat Smith. It says, Pat's Pantry for the Poor. She has no money. Pat will be glad that I told you that. She was a state worker, lost her job years ago, was crying in her little trailer up in Havana. She said, uh, as she was crying, God said, get up and go help somebody. And she said, Look, I don't have it. I just lost my job. I don't have anything. I got a cupboard with a few cans of beanie weenies and some Vienna sausage. He says, take it out to the poor. She got in her, her old beat up van. She took those beanie weenies. She went and found a homeless center. I mean, a homeless camp, not a center. She found some. I said, she came to me. I said, Pat, you can't do that. You can't. A female can't go out there in the woods and do that. She's only been doing it now 10 years, so she didn't listen very well. <laughs> Praise God, she didn't listen very well. She didn't know that you can't do it. People have given her a truck since then. She still doesn't have any money. She comes to our store at least once or twice a month and, hey, Brother Glenn, you think you can give me 20 bucks for gas so I can get back home? So when she sent me a thing and said, I'm all in, I had to laugh. So I sent her a thing back and I said, I love you, sister. I thank you. I appreciate you being all in, even if we're the ones going to have to loan you the money to give us. <laughs> and she laughed and she goes, all I know is God said to, to, to get in, I assume he'll give the money. Right? I just want to share that with you because this is all the truth, everything I just told you. I gave you an example of how we operate. That's an example of what God will do. That's by far and away the most response we've ever had. We still have, there's people way beyond there. We're well over 100 now. We're just looking for the ones that God touched your heart and says, a dollar a day. All right, I'm going to turn it back over to Pastor Steve after I pray. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your love, mercy, and provision. I thank you for this church. What a sweet home you have given us here. We thank you for the other churches where we've ministered to in the, the years we've been in Tallahassee. But not just how you minister to us, but how you minister through us or this church is truly what I love about it. Thank you for Pastor Steve. Thank you for... Miss Yvonne, thank you for the teams here. Thank you for my brothers and sisters. Thank you for the, that this is a place that I can, in the highways and the byways, go tell people where to come. And even though Beth and I may be here two weeks later from speaking somewhere else, and we'll come in and Pastor Steve will know their name. Somebody here will have put their arms around them. And, um, and this is truly what the book, what the church in the book of Acts 2 and 4 talks about. Where everyone shared what they have such that none had need. Help us, Father, because there's still a very needy community around us. Help us to, to be open and giving and let you flow through us what you will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our prayer is that God will take this word and plant good eternal seeds deep into your soul. Father, we pray for your great wisdom to infiltrate this listener, draw them to you, and take them gently down the road to their next destination in life. And if you're in need of a home church, we invite you to join us at Christian Heritage Church on Shera Road in Tallahassee, Florida, a multicultural church founded on the truth of God's Word and the power of the Holy Spirit. For a worship service where the presence of God has first place, you're invited to Christian Heritage Church. Sunday morning service is at 1030, Wednesday evening at 7, plus youth group and kid power and small groups and more. For all the latest information, visit our website, chctoday.com.